Okay, hi everybody. So um, this year we'll be doing something different. Uh, we're introducing power pitches. And this is a chance for about 15 posters to be highlighted during this session uh, in very brief two minute slots. Um, we are trying to make this uh, very quick and efficient. So I would ask everybody that's presenting a power pitch to be very close to the front. Uh, the order in which we'll go is uh, poster 6, 7, 8, 13, 17, 34, 43, 46, 48, 50, 54, 58, 63, and 68. This is just for people that need to know when their turn comes. Uh, for each of you, uh, we have a slide that uh, has the name and the poster number. When you come to the stage, you will just advance, and a timer will start, and it will go for only two minutes. And now all of you will clap at the end of those two minutes. So if people go over, they will be interrupted. We need to be efficient because there is a session at two. Uh, so uh, let's try to make this fun, hopefully informative as well. So Anita, if you could kick things off. All right. Do I click? Thank you. Um, I think I have bingo, by the way. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much, uh, uh, John and Carly and all the others for putting this off. Um, how many of knew, you know what RA21 is? Could I see a show of hands? How many of you do not know what RA21 is? Ah, thank you. Um, so for those of you who do know what RA21 is, um, I would love to talk more about it. I have only learned about it a couple of days ago because Todd Carpenter asked me to present this poster. And I would love to talk with you, especially if there are any questions at my poster, number six. Um, Briefly, RA21 is an effort um, that's led by NISO, the uh, standards organization, um, uh, STMJ, the, the scientific, technical, and medical publishers, and a very broad group of stakeholders, including librarians, institutions, and groups like EBSCO, um, to come up with a way for users to log on and get access to content that they have previously been given access to through IP authentication. So the idea is, you have a student or a member of a faculty who is on a mobile device who is not at the campus, who is not logging in through the IP at the campus getting access to this content. And so it's really quite a technical pitch. It's saying, how do we solve this using SAML technologies? Um, in brief, the project has had three pilots. Uh, they have picked one particular way to do the technology. They've looked at user experience, and they've looked at privacy. Um, we're gathering thoughts and opinions. So anybody who's interested in being informed and involved in this, we very much invite you to participate. If you have concerns concerning privacy or user friendliness, please come see us and join the project. And it's poster number six. Um, we're planning to roll this out as a NISO implementation um, over the next couple of months. So now is the time to join. Thank you very much. How's it going, everybody? My name is Ben Busby. I work for the National Center of Biotechnology Information in the United States. Um, I'm a data scientist who functions as the Genomic Outreach Coordinator and Bioinformatics Training Lead. Uh, and what that means is, uh, one of the things it means is I run a lot of hackathons. Uh, if you're interested in hackathons, interested in building software prototypes, check out this website. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do in these hackathons. So these are collaborative hackathons. We get teams of four to seven individuals together, and we build prototype software in three days. So uh, typically, 80% of teams uh, are able to finish an alpha or beta prototype, and about 10% of teams publish a manuscript on what they've built. So that's something we're very proud of. Uh, we've run 27 NCBI-style hackathons over the last three years. It's a lot of travel. Uh, we run them all over the United States, and there is one that runs itself every year in Vancouver called HackSeek. Um, so again, something to check out. Um, and uh, we've collaborated with a number of other institutions to run hackathons, there'll be one soon, uh, at University of Texas Southwestern and at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, so those things are also on this website. Uh, we've built uh, somewhere on the order of about 160 pieces of prototype software. And these hackathons are really for postdocs and other professionals, as well as librarians uh, who happen to be able to code. 
Um, and so um, they run nine to six every day. Nobody's sleeping on the floor or whatever. Uh, none of that. So uh, if you're interested, check out this website. The last thing I would say is that Elixir, Bosk, uh, some of the Tokyo hackathons are also on that website. So it's supposed to be an international repository of hackathons. The question we would like to ask is, do we already have a full workflow full of open or even Commons compliant tools? Do we? Who thinks we do? No, because when, why would you still be here? <laughs> but in, deci in looking at that and dec in deciding what we need, it's really important what type of criteria do you set? Because is it enough for tools to be freely available? Or is there more to it? And what different choices do you make? And what does that say about the availability of tools and what we want to develop and what we can use? And these are choices for researchers in their day-to-day -day workflow in deciding what to use. They're also choices for organizations, uh, governments, funders in trying to, uh, to decide what they support and what they encourage. Um, so what we would like you to do, we would like you to invite uh, to, to invite you to really think about these questions and try them hands-on. We've got this on our poster, number eight, where you can try it and see the effect of your choices. See when you flick these switches what happens to tools that are available that meet your criteria or that meet your funder's criteria or, or whatever. And we do have a session later on right here in this, uh, in this hall uh, at 2.30 when we will do this with the whole group. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to talk about accessibility real quick. Um, Sorry. All right, there's the countdown. Uh, I like to watch captions when I watch TV, in part because my daughter is usually sleeping when I'm watching TV, so I need to keep the volume kind of low, and also in part because it helps me figure out what people are actually saying. Um, this image is kind of a good example of that. I love watching the Great British Bake Off, but I'm not British. So there's a lot of terms that they use that I've never heard before, like agra. And when I'm watching with captions, I can actually see what that is, look it up, figure out what's going on. Um, so how does this relate to the poster? Well, in our institutional repository, we realized we had about 7,000 um, AV files that most of them did not have captions, and we wanted to make sure that they were accessible to all of our users and also useful to all of our users. Um, so we're getting kind of close to a retrospective, or finishing up a retrospective project to um, caption a, a portion of those. It's only about a quarter of them. Um, and we're working on uh, the other ones, but it's kind of led us into a larger project of looking at all of the content in our repository and whether or not um, it's actually accessible to all of our users. Um, we are short on staff, and so we're kind of trying to do this on a shoestring, and really, I wanted to talk about this because if there are other folks out there who are working on accessibility of the content in their repositories, I would really love to talk to you. Um, and also, by the way, AGA is an oven that's kind of always on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daniela. I'm Trisha. And we're part of the Make Data Count project. Uh, so imagine a world where data are first class research output. Uh, we're focused on making data level metric infrastructure. Our poster is number 17. Uh, if you can see all the postcards and stickers, come get them. Uh, they're for repositories and publishers to be thinking about how you can standardize data usage metrics and how you can get citations. Um, our poster is a five step walkthrough specifically for repositories on how you can use our counter code of practice that we published, how you can standardize your logs, how you can submit them to a data site open hub, and how as a repository you can display open data level metrics for views, downloads, and citations. And um, there's also something in this for publishers. Um, my colleague earlier today, Christian Garza, presented on how we're doing as a community in citing data. And I think we've made baby steps. And I really think that we can make really big hurdles in this space. Uh, many, many, many data pub um, publishers have uh, 
publishing policies, and so we would like to see some action out of those publishing policies. Um, come visit our poster and you can see why and how to cite um, data and tag your data citations with Crossref, and you can also see as a publisher how to consume those metrics. The last part is an interactive um, part of this session, and we're going to say make data count. This side of the room is going to say make, this side of the room is going to say data, this side of the room is going to say count, and then we're going to cry because it's going to be so beautiful. Okay, on one. I'm coming in from Sri Lanka. Actually, you are familiar with uh, academic out library outreach activities. Uh, uh, here, I can uh, show you how we conduct outreach activities in Sri Lanka. Actually, first, we identified the importance of scholarly community engagement. Then we conduct outreach activities to serve the academic community scholarly way. You can see my poster 34. Uh, and now academic libraries have become meeting place for the security, uh, for the scholarly community. Under these outreach programs, we teach how to produce quality research piece to the community. Uh, you can see, uh, of course, my poster, we have conducted, uh, uh, in a year, we have conducted several uh, programs to reach our academic community uh, going out of, uh, beyond our walls, library walls, uh, because uh, undergraduates and uh, master graduates, uh, postgraduates, uh, they need to submit research uh, theses. So we conduct um, research workshops, how to write your academic thesis a scholarly way, academic way. Those are the things we uh, produce here. Those are very successful because uh, people, especially undergraduate and master graduates, they do not have much knowledge to write uh, academic theses uh, the, the, for uh, the benefit for our scholarly community. Uh, thank you so much. Right. Hi. Uh, in my research, I uh, used to train rats to press a lever to get cocaine. So they press a lever, they'll get some coke, I'll get some data, so we're both happy. <laughs> the problem with that is that we're ending up having a lot of little small files, small data sets that never got shared. And why is that reason? You could think of a thousand reasons why they wouldn't share. I'll focus on three here, because time is limited. The first one is the lack of immediate incentive. Time is a luxury. And why should I spend less time today writing a grant, conducting more experiments, writing my next paper, and spend that time sharing data to maybe get cited in a few years? And even when I do so, it's difficult. It's difficult because my expertise is not in data sharing. It's not data management. And this is a whole set of rules or standards that are important that I need to understand to be able to share those data. And because of that, you know, I've been lazy, so I'm so far behind in my practices right now that to get to the best practices where I should be today is literally crossing a mountain. We're talking big motivation here. So how do we tackle this challenge at Pillar Science? Well, the first thing we do is that we don't impose a system. We work on top of what people already have. We help them integrate the tools that they already use and already like and make them more efficient. We help them teach the best practices so they can save time. Because in the end, that's what matters the most. So poster number 36, talk to you later. All right, we made it. Um, hello, my name is Alberto. This is my colleague, Matias. And for the past few years, we've been repeating ourselves a mantra. You probably heard it before, uh, which goes like that. Researchers produce 21st century research. They write it up using 20th century technology, and they publish it in 17th century format. Um, so I think we all agree that researchers produce 21st century research. If it's not new, it's not science. But um, when we write up our research, we're still using tools that really belong to the past century at a time when most researchers were working offline and alone, and today we're working online and together. 
So we're using PDF, Word, LaTeX, or Clippy. Uh, you know that you're using a tool that was really built uh, and developed in the 1980s. What's most, even more, most depressing is that we're publishing in a, in a format which really is 400 years old, we're really printing or you know, uh, uh, producing content that is really meant to be printed. Um, so um, Matthias and I independently have developed tools and platforms, authority and manuscripts, which are editors, collaborative editors for research. And in the spirit of collaboration, we're now um, coming together and joining forces uh, in building a uh, next generation research tool, uh, uh, which is open source, and it's for producing uh, research papers for the next generation. Uh, so stuff that is, first of all, HTML first, uh, it's data driven, so data and code are crucial components of what we're building and the paper uh, of the future that we have in mind, and it's fully reproducible. So you can attach data to the paper, you can edit and add code, and you can run a paper the same way you're running software. Uh, our poster is right here, it was hidden in a very secluded place right behind the screen, but now it's uh, visible, so we're right here. Come say hi, and uh, looking forward to see you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Melissa, and I'm very excited to be here today to introduce a new open access journal to the FORCE community. Emerging Library and Information Perspectives published its first issue in May of this past year. But I'm also here to get feedback from this community. As a limited duties instructor at Western University, I teach an associated course that is integrated with the publishing workflow of this journal. That course is called Scholarly Communication and Open Access Publishing. And through that course, 25 students actively engage in the publishing workflow of this journal. They serve as the peer reviewers. They also actively engage in some of the production processes to get this journal published. So I'm looking for feedback from all of you on what Master of Library and Information Science students need to know in order to jump right in once they enter the workforce and to move towards an open access, open source future. I'm also very pleased to announce that this journal is hosted on OJS. We were in the final stages of launching this journal on the Digital Commons platform just as B Press was acquired by Elsevier. And that prompted a number of discussions. We ultimately decided to be the first journal at Western University to move to OJS. And Western Libraries has since shift in the process of shifting all of their journals to OJS. So that certainly frames the course. It frames the course in that we want to apply a critical framework and get students thinking about not just the tools that are in use at the institutions in which they may one day work, but also other tools that may do things better in order to serve that open access, open source future. So please get in touch. I have the contact information on the slide for the journal as well as myself, and the poster is number 46 right over there. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So last year, my girlfriend invited me to an event called Women in Research. She's a feminist. And this. Now, I was under the influence of what I heard in that um, session. It was basically about uh, the problems of being a female scholar, scientist, researcher. And uh, a lot of things that were mentioned by them was around, for instance, being a mother in academia, the glass ceiling, that kind of stuff. And as I went home, I started to think about, OK, what about publication? I am mainly focused on uh, authorship practices in my uh, uh, PhD thesis, and then I started to do some research about um, uh, gender disparity in authorship and what other people had done before. What I figured out very quickly was that a lot of studies that are published at the moment are not very accurate. So what these studies do is that they basically extract the name of the authors, they dump it into a uh, gender identification uh, software or platform, and then they somehow say, okay, 75% with 75% accuracy, we can say that. Um, this person is a male or a female or that kind of stuff. So I decided to uh, go the hard way, which was going to my university and ask a list of staff uh, per school. So I have analyzed uh, information from three schools, School of Computing, School of Electrical Engineering, and School of uh, Manufacturing uh, Engineering. And what I found out was that um, female authors, for whatever reason, tend to collaborate less with international authors 
they publish less and they also receive fewer citations compared to their male counterparts. I am there, poster number 48. I have more interesting uh, information, and I'm also open to receive feedback, comments, and any um, ideas. Thank you very much. OK, my name is Olga Kos, and I am from Georgia one of the university, Kennesaw State University. I am a research librarian, but at the same time, I am a scholar, a researcher, and my topic is informal communication, community of practice. Uh, I am one of the founding members of a research collaborative or research consortium, a community of researchers who try to support each other as a faculty-driven organization. Uh, support research cycle. A lot of uh, meetings, uh, publications about scholarly communication, about scholarly publishing, about formal channel of communication. But I think it's very important to start where research started, which is informal communication, what's happened between researchers. And my poster is an attempt to study this community, how they communicate with each other, and how researchers communicate externally. Um, not a lot has been written about that, and I would like to focus. At first, I'm a librarian in a small university. I don't have control over publishing and business model on publishing. I have barely have control over what we receive what as librarians. So whatever I have control, access, I will try to do in my own space. And I think it's very important for emerging scholars, this collaborative team, research, building emerging scholars, because our university is a teaching university, so our major work about that. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Pierre Montagno, and I'm going to be talking about our partnership, Code Ocean's partnership with Taylor and Francis. Uh, so I'm going to start off by just telling you what Code Ocean is. Code Ocean is a, is a cloud-based reproducibility platform that allows publishers uh, to publish their code and data plus the computing environment. Um, so it's not just the code and data, but it's everything that uh, is needed for the code to run. So dependencies, all sorts of different packages. And we uh, containerize it, so we're sort of like an overlay to Docker, so that anyone can come to a compute capsule, which you can see here uh, embedded in a Taylor and Francis article, and just simply cl click the run button, and you can execute the code. Uh, but it also, uh, you know, we're also working on uh, tools that are going to help uh, facilitate uh, the researcher, not just at point of publication, but further down in the workflow as well. And uh, so our, our new UI also includes things like um, being able to spin off live machines, being able to open a, a Jupyter Notebook, our studio. And, um, but, but for this particular partnership, the, 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 the value here is that when someone's reading an article, right, Right? We're, we're hoping to get this ecosystem of interconnected you know, code and data along with the narrative. So when someone's reading the narrative of the article, they can also come to the code and data and actually execute the code and data directly from the article. So it's really enhancing reproducibility. So the Code Ocean technology can be embedded in any platform. Here's an example with Taylor Francis, but it also can be viable for institutional repositories and other initiatives, and I'd love to talk more. Uh, poster 54, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Tirthankar from IIT Patna. So I am a doctoral scholar over there. So my uh, PhD thesis is, is about exploring various uh, AI assistance to the various stages of the academic peer review process. So we know that uh, 
the peer review system is uh, nevertheless very uh, time consuming and uh, t t and um, up till date it is too much human centric so like many a times what happens that uh, we submit papers and uh, we get an editorial uh, response after maybe two or three months that my paper was not actually within the scope of that particular journal so uh, a huge amount of time is wasted uh, in, in this process. So our uh, objective is to um, uh, develop an AI, an AI-assisted system that would help the uh, editors uh, to, uh, to, to know that uh, this particular paper is not uh, within the scope of this journal, or maybe flag it, and uh, aid him in taking appropriate decisions uh, in, in reasonable time. Uh, and another thing that it could be an, uh, also an aid to the um, authors who could, uh, who could make well informed decisions in time. So the overall objective is to uh, speed up the entire peer review process and uh, and uh, and uh, and how that uh, this particular ai could serve as an um, uh, um, aid to the editors as well as the authors by harnessing uh, the the prowess of nlp ml and um, information um, uh, extraction techniques over here so uh, we are uh, we are we, we experimented with several feature engineering steps as in the traditional machine learning as well as uh, with uh, deep learning uh, deep learning like encoding the uh, because a research paper is a, a multimodal kind of thing. So uh, the images are also a complement to the text. So encoding text and images, both of them, to finally uh, classify whether a paper is falling within the scope of the journal or not. Or will the ambitious vision is to tackle novelty in research articles. Thank you. You can come to my poster at 63. Hi, I'm Gunter Eisenbach. I'm a publisher with Jamia Publications in Toronto. I love the idea to replace our peer reviewers with artificial intelligence, <laughs> but the reality is we still depend on humans, and that has a lot of problems. As all of you know, just to name two of the problems we're facing with, one is to find peer reviewers, to incentivize them to deliver high quality reviews and deliver them on time. That's one of, part of the problem. Another the bigger problem is, for example, the problem of predatory journals, journals which pretend that they do peer review, but there's no proof of this kind of activity, peer review activity. And we think that some of these problems can be addressed by putting records of who reviewed what into an openly accessible kind of database uh, blockchain can be thought of as, a, as an openly accessible database. There are companies out there like Poplons which try to solve the incentive uh, problem uh, in terms of creating more incentives for tenure and promotion by collecting this data. But we think the, the better approach would be an openly accessible database not owned by a certain company. <laughs> Um, which can also be used by kind of secondary application. So our big idea is to create a digital currency, which we call R coin, to hand out to our reviewers, editors, authors, to incentivize them to do the right thing. So it, you can think of it as an academic currency to do the right thing, to peer review, to uh, do academic editing for a manuscript, we have already such a system in place, we call it Karma Credits, that's outside of the blockchain. Our big idea is to put this in the blockchain, to offer this system to other publishers, to other, to other players in the scholarly communication environment, libraries, funders. Uh, visit us at the poster, poster 68. Thank you. So first, a big thank you to our presenters. Uh, I'm. I'm very happy this format worked. I would love to get feedback on you know, whether we should continue and what we could do better. Thank you for being a captive audience. And a big thank you to Tommy Boschkowski, my student, who made this Power Pitch possible.